read our text reading. Happy Lord's Day. Good to see each one here this morning. We are, again, one Lord's Day closer to the Day of the Lord. Amen. And that should be exciting for us, which actually is a consideration of the messages the last couple of weeks. We are still in Matthew chapter 24. This week's reading is from chapter 8, excuse me, verse 8, chapter 24, verse 8, and we're going to read down through verse 14. Verse 8, Jesus says, All these things are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then you shall be offended, many of you shall be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne once again this day with truly thankful hearts for your many blessings, for your watchful care, your continued guidance. Lord, we ask that you be with us in this service, that your name might be glorified, that all things that are said and done would be for your glory and for your honor. Father, bless this reading that it might convict our hearts, draw us close to you, give us the strength and the endurance to endure these times, to look for your, your coming with joy and gladness. Lord, I pray that if there is one here that does not know you in the free pardon of sin, that your spirit might convict that the one might be saved before it's everlastingly too late. Father, forgive us where we fail you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. These messages are really intended to be encouraging, to give us hope. And yet, as I, I listen to sometimes people talk, Christian people especially, they're, they're a little bit frightened of the things that are happening. I think there's fear in a lot of people, not just the world, with the uncertainty of the way things are going, and there's no denying that. I, in my opinion, as I said, um, more than any other time in human history, I think there is a global sense of uncertainty. There's always been uncertainty in the world, especially in different parts, different locations, even in our own nation. In the time of depression, time of recession, you know, we're kind of on our own in those things, and we worked our way through it as a nation. We rebounded. Um, there have been times when there's been global strife with World War I, World War II, other global events where the nations are kind of conflicted and battling. But I don't think it's ever been like this. And that's just not fear speak. I'm not trying to scare people into anything. I think there is a sense of real uncertainty and a sense of real fear. And I think that permeates into those that are believers. And one thing, and we're going to address this in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure exactly when. But one thing I think the Christian world is actively hoping for is the imminent return of Christ, the rapture, to catch God's people away before things begin to get really bad. And I don't necessarily think that's going to be the case. My opinion is, and I'll address this more in a future lesson, but my belief is that God's people will be here up until the very end when he returns at the conclusion of all of these things which means there's going to be things that happen that are going to test us, that are going to try us. He says some very um, frightening things here that he has told his disciples before. Um, he says they will, in verse 9, he says they will deliver you up to be afflicted, shall kill you. Well, that doesn't sound pleasant. It reminds me of a passage actually back earlier in Matthew when Jesus uh, first addressed his disciples, at least in Matthew's account, when he first addresses them. Uh, he says uh, in, let me see if I can find the passage I'm thinking of. Might be chapter 6. This is the thought that came to me as I was going over these things in my mind. Um, oh, I can't find it. Anyway, I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. He, he tells his disciples to rejoice when you're persecuted, to count it a blessing when you're persecuted. Almost seems contradictory. How is that a blessing for us? 
Well, it is a blessing if we're, if we're persecuted for our faith in the Lord. If we're persecuted for our stand and our confidence in the Lord, that is a blessing. And yet, at the same time, it is trying. The Bible says, uh, last week we looked at this in verse 8, where it says, these are the beginnings of sorrows. And we noted that those are birth pains, that the earth is growing, going through birth pains. So we know there's going to be a time of great affliction for the people of God. That hasn't happened in several centuries, at least not to Western Christians, American Christians. We haven't faced physical persecution. But I was thinking about this also. Just kind of think about this. I wonder how many more saints, that is saved, baptized people who believe in the Lord, church members, I wonder how many more of those were lost during these times of peace than were lost during times of persecution. Now, let me explain what I mean. I think that there's been a lot of Christian people, saved, baptized people, who have become, because of peace, because of no persecution, have become comfortable in this world, have become settled in this world, have actually become actively involved and partakers of the sins of this world. Not isolating themselves, not trying to show because of persecution that they have faith in the Lord, but they have become settled and their, their faith has weakened and they become very comfortable in this world. That really is the idea I want to address this morning. But let's look at this first. I addressed this a few weeks ago as we considered the deception that is going to come upon the world. In verse 11, Jesus says, Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Let me point this out as well, just to keep this in context. That this whole discourse, he's talking to his church. He's talking really to the twelve and giving them a warning. So by extension, this has been passed down to the generations, to his church. He's talking to his church. So this deception, this hatred, this killing is going to be to his church. Jesus told them earlier in his ministry, if they, if they hate me, they are going to hate you. If they persecute me, they are going to persecute you. Well, how, how does that make us happy? How does that give us hope looking for these things? It really is challenging to us. There's no question about that. So he says that false prophets will arise and deceive many. And then he says this, because of iniquity, or because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. Not many in the world. They don't have the kind of love to really be hot or cold. They're just really what I, I'll use the term indifferent. Those that are of the world, those that are lost, those that have no concern about spiritual things, they are not hot or cold. They are just really indifferent. But the saints of the Lord, they are the ones that can be hot for the Lord, on fire for the Lord, serving God with passion, or they can be cold. This is who he's talking about. And he says, it is because iniquity is going to abound that the love, and I'm going to insert the saints here. He says, the, he says many, but I think he's referring to the saints. The love of the saints will, gra will grow cold. Old King James says wax cold. The love of many saints will grow cold. And then he says this, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall come the end. So what does he mean in verse 13? That he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. Baptists have historically always believed and preached, once saved, always saved, that you cannot lose your salvation. I believe that. Do you? Do you believe that when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, that there's nothing you can do to lose that salvation? And that's true. I believe there's plenty of scriptures to back that up. So what's he talking about here about this endurance to the end. Does that mean that those that don't endure, that they are going to be lost, that they're going to be condemned to a devil's hell? Well, that can't be proven by scripture. But what can be proven is that endurance is something that every child of God needs, especially in these times of trial, 
We need endurance. Now, I'm going to use a, a physical analogy here that if, if a person becomes lazy and doesn't do anything physically active and then they decide to go out and run a marathon. Like a few weeks ago, the LA Marathon was um, televised. I don't even know why they do this. They televised live a marathon. Who wants to watch people run for 26 <laughs> miles? I don't know where the excitement is in that. But nonetheless, there was a news station that televised the entire marathon. So I thought, I'm going to wake up early today and go out and run a marathon. 26.2 miles. I haven't run 0.2 miles <laughs> in I don't know how long. So if I'm going to go out and try and run a marathon, I won't even make it half a mile until I'm laying there gasping for breath. <laughs> so the same type of thing is true spiritually. We need endurance, and endurance comes by practice. We have to practice. We have to exercise. We have to exercise our faith. And that it's important for this. So, and the whole part of this message, I think, is, is circling around the fact that God's people need to be ready for what's coming. I don't even think if I was to really start training, I can't do it because of my position, the fact that I love the Lord and I love being with his people. I couldn't commit the time to train for a marathon. But if I didn't care about the things of the Lord and I put that aside for a year and I decided to slowly start training, running 0.2 miles every day and then build it up to a mile and increase it and increase it and then go try and you know run a marathon, I might be able to complete it. I'd probably work up to a 5K which I think is three miles, um, might be able to do that. But you get my point, though. You have to build up this endurance. And so many Christians in the world today have become lazy that they don't have the endurance to deal with what lies ahead. I, I've been thinking about this. I've got so many articles that I've written in my mind that have yet to become on paper. <laughs> but this is another one that was added to my list um, recently. And the title of it is, Are You Ready for What's Coming? Are you ready for what is coming down the pike? I hate that term, but I'm going to use it here. There's something coming. There's something challenging that is coming for the world. It's challenging. And the world is going to try and find all kinds of answers, all kinds of, kinds of ways to correct what is happening. What, what's amazing to me is even the things we have no control over, the things that, such as weather, earthquakes, those type of things, they're telling us that there are things we can do to actually change the weather. The weather is getting pretty crazy, isn't it? Didn't they just have a whole series of tornadoes in South Texas where they've never had tornadoes before? That caught them off guard. But things are getting pretty crazy. Hurricanes are getting more intense, and I don't know how to gauge these things, uh, but they're telling us that that's the case. They're telling us we need to drive less in order to... Um, get the ozone layer back into place so that the, the, the world can correct itself. Well, <clears throat> that's a farce. We have no control over that. But the money situation, gas prices, um, religion is so confusing. Po politics is confusing worldwide. There's going to come a globalization of these things. I don't know about you, but this coin bit idea, hmm. what, what, I don't even know what that is. What is that? Is that virtual money? Is it not real? I, I don't know what it is, but it frightens me um, in a way because we know that in the end, there's going to be a uniform money system that if you're not bought into, you're not going to be able to survive. You have to be part of this thing. So it's all coming. It's all set up. It's all ready to go. That um, the mark of the beast, we don't know what exactly that is. If it is a microchip, that's in place and ready to go. I don't know how soon they're going to implement it, but they're trying to. They've already done it with animals. They're trying to do it with humans. So all these things are, are concerning. The world is going to have answers for all of this. That leaves God's people out in the cold. What do we do? Where do we turn? Because we're not going to turn to the world. So we have to have this endurance built up to um, deal with these things. I, I want to go to Luke's account in this. Go over to Luke's Gospel, it's chapter 21. He actually gives a little bit of a different perspective. Well, he says the same thing. He actually says it a little bit differently that I thought might be interesting for us to read before we move on to some passages to tie in with what Jesus says there. So in Luke chapter 21, and I'm going to start reading in verse 5. 
This is the same account, same time period that Jesus is speaking here. Same situation, same scenario. Verse 5. <clears throat> and some spake of the, um, of the temple and how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. Jesus said, As for these things which you behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be one, not left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? Remember they asked the question in Matthew? Will be the sign of your coming? So it's the same, same situation here. It's, I think it's an identical event, the same time period. So Jesus said, Take heed that you be not deceived. We talked about that. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and the time draweth near. Go you not after them. We're going to talk deal with that more in the future, that idea. But when you shall hear of wars and commotions, Matthew says rumors of wars, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by, the end is not yet. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines, pestilences, fearful sights, great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these things, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up into synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And all those things happened to the, the apostles in the first century and going forward. Happened throughout many centuries. And it shall turn to you. Well, let, me, let me back up. I'm going to read that in context. So you'll be, you be put in prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. How can we not think about the things that are coming? How can we not think about how we might handle persecution? Yet Jesus tell, tells us not to. He's telling us not to worry about the things. So my advice in this message and in the messages prior and the messages to come in this series is don't worry. Everything is under control. Everything is going as scripted in the scriptures. The world doesn't see it. They don't identify it, but we do. I thought about this, this idea, and, and I kind of tossed it back and forth in my mind. But for God's people, I think we just need to put our faith in the Lord, rely on his grace, and sit back and enjoy the show. The troubling thing apart that, about that, though, is that there's many we love, many we know, that are going to fall away. They're going to fall away. They have fallen away. They're no longer around. There may be some that we see give themselves entirely over to the system of this world. And we can't take enjoyment in that. So we must continue to be a witness. But when we're doing that, just put ourselves entirely in the hands of God and allow him to work in our lives. And sit back and enjoy the show. Because it's not going to change. The world is not going to gain the victory. Satan is not going to gain the victory of the Lord. It is finished. It's done. So we just need to put our faith in him. Jesus said in Matthew, in that account we read, that the love of many is going to grow cold. Growing to go cold, grow cold. Let's, let's look at some passages that kind of deal with this. First of all, first, um, nope, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. Both letters to the Thessalonian church, Paul writes, he deals with the subject of the coming of the Lord. In this passage here, we already looked at one in uh, the prior 1 Thessalonians, the first book. Let's consider what he says here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. So Paul writes here to these saints, and keep in mind, as I mentioned, in the first century here, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the gospel began to spread. Every generation of Christians believed that he was going to come back in their lifetime. And here we are 20 centuries later saying the same thing. And the scoffers are saying, you guys are fools. He's not coming. Where is he? It's been 2,000 years. And yet we know that everything is still under control. And what our hope is, is that it is going to happen. So he says to this church, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or troubled 
neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of the Lord is at hand. Did you catch what he said there? Don't be troubled. It, now, there's been a lot of trouble physically. A lot of people suffered physically, but there's trouble that is going to affect our mind. And that's what Satan loves to attack is the mind, to affect our mind, to change our mind, to get our mind focused on things that don't matter and off of the eternal things that do matter. So don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. We call him the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The one who is not Christ, but claims to be Christ. The one who is not God, but claims to be God. And he's going to have such powerful, deceiving ideas and practices that it's going to deceive the world. And if possible, Jesus says in one place, even the very elect, the saints. The saints are not above deception. The saints are not above. In fact, this falling away that he talks about here is the saints falling away. And this seems to be a specific event, a specific time. There has always been people, individuals that have fallen away. There have been churches that have fallen away. But this seems to be a much larger event where a, a, on a global scale, the saints of God are going to be deceived and many will fall away. Not all. Jesus even asked the question in one place, when the Son of Man returns, will he find the faith on the earth? And the answer is yes. But the question is, will he find it in me? Will he find it in you? Will he find it in us as a church? That should be our goal, is to, is to be a, an assembly that is here no matter what is happening in the world, but that we belong to him and when he returns, we will be with him. We've often joked about um, when that happens. I, I would like to think and I hope that we are assembled together when that happens. I've jokingly said that it's probably going to be a Wednesday night around 7.05. <laughs> so be here <laughs> because we don't know when it's going to happen. But who knows? I don't know. I have no idea when it's going to happen. Jesus said, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven. Only God knows these things. But he's given us clues. He's given us signs to look for. And if you are so focused on your little world that you're not seeing what's going on in the world, you are susceptible to deception. It is so important that the saints of God gather together. So it may be on a Sunday morning. People often ask uh, what time we start. And we start at 7.45. So perhaps the Lord will come on a Sunday morning about 7.50. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> 9. <laughs> You're all looking like, huh? <laughs> I've been here at 7 o'clock everywhere have you been? No, I'm, it's 9 o'clock. 9.45 is the hour, 9.45. So maybe he's going to come at 9.50. Again, I'm having, I'm having fun with that. It's not going to be like that. I don't know. I'm trying to stress the importance of putting the Lord first in our lives and being assembled together. And, of course, we, we all understand that um, there's things that come up. There's reasons why people can't assemble, that they don't assemble, all kinds of reasons. You don't owe me an explanation at all. But the Lord's going to return, and he's going to gather his saints together. That much we know. So the day will not come unless a falling away comes first. I'm not going to even try to guess if that has already happened or if it is something that is going to happen yet in the future. This event of this great falling away seems to be associated with this man of sin and his revealing. But this man of sin, it says he's going to oppose 
and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, there's no temple yet. Well, there's the, the temple of the Lord, his church, his body. That much we know, but there's no physical temple for this man of sin to occupy yet. But if you're paying attention to what's going on in Israel, and I don't, there's all kinds of questions we have about the building of the third temple. But apparently, everything is in place. You can actually, there's a, a virtual tour you can take through the third temple. It's a magnificent structure, beautiful building, um, unlike anywhere in the world. So it's, it's all set. We don't know when it's going to happen. There are signs pointing to it possibly happening soon within the next couple of years. We don't know exactly when, but when that happens and the son, this, the son of, of perdition occupies that temple, claims himself to be God, that's really a time to start paying attention. And he's warning God's people. So apparently God's people will be here during this time. He says in verse 5, and I'm going to talk about that more because we, we, we're going to get into Daniel chapter 9 in the coming weeks when we talk about these things. So we'll tie that in more during that time. But in verse 5, he says, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is withhold, what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now lets, will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. There's another event coming where, I'm just going to paraphrase this, I'll talk about this more also, but maybe something to think about in the coming weeks, that verse 7, I believe is speaking about something that is, is keeping this from happening keeping this man from declaring himself to be God, even preventing a temple from being built. But once this, this whatever is withholding this, I believe it to be the Holy Spirit, once the, once the Holy Spirit moves aside and allows Satan to continue with his real goal, and that is to have global control over all of mankind. It's called the mystery of iniquity. It's, been, it's always been at work since Adam sold himself over and all of mankind to this deception. It's been at work since then, and it's been culminating and building as, as sorrows, pains of a woman who is going to give birth, and then it's going to intensify and intensify, and finally God is going to say, okay, you now have control over the world. Folks, that's not a time where we want to start, you know, we want to play religion. We want to pretend that we're on board with God or not. We need to be on board with God before these things happen. I want to read some more verses uh, regarding these as well. In fact, I want to go to, uh, first of all, Revelation chapter 2. I just want to read a few things uh, regarding two of the seven churches that are mentioned in Revelation. Many people are familiar with these seven churches of Asia. I know most of you are. Um, and there's a varying opinions about these churches and what they possibly represent. Um, in my opinion, I, I don't necessarily think they represent different church ages, different ages for the 2,000 year period for the church. I, I think simply these are seven specific churches that the Lord deals with on a very personal level with very strong warnings. So the first one we want to consider is in chapter 2, verse 1, where, and this church is very familiar in the New Testament, it's the Ephesus church. We see their beginning in Acts chapter 19, when Paul actually rebaptizes some men, and no doubt women were there, but it just says men, of course. Um, he he rebaptizes them and organizes the church. And then we see them grow to the point to where they are a very sound, doctrinally sound church. The letter of Ephesians is written to this church. We're going to talk about that in a moment as we close. But this church is very strong, very sound, 
They identify liars. They point them out. They don't accept their false doctrine. But notice what he says to this church. To the angel. Many accept that to be the pastor of the church. I accept that. The messenger of the church. Not as if the pastor is some angelic being. Although I did have a guy one time. I'm not sure I told you this or not. Well, apparently I did. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell it again. Um, I invited a guy from work to come, and he sat in the back. He was kind of a hyper-religious kind of guy. So he came to church and stayed for the whole service, sat in the back wearing a, a Yankee jacket and I think a Yankee hat. <laughs> but um, anyway, stayed for the whole service, and I, I just talked to him briefly after service. And when I saw him on Monday, um, he said, uh, he goes, I really enjoyed the service. In fact, I saw angels dancing on your shoulders. <laughs> I go, what? <laughs> Angels dancing on my shoulders, really. I, he was kind of a weird guy. That could have potentially been my boss, and I was going to be hired directly under this guy, but fortunately I wasn't. It was another guy who was a little bit more sane, actually a lot more sane. Um, but if, if, I, if I identified right away that this guy was kind of crazy, and I, if I would have been hired to work under him, I wouldn't have taken the job. But anyway, we had a lot of good discussions with his uh, crazy ideas, but that was one of them. Anyway, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I believe those stars represent the pastors as well, um, and the candlesticks represent the individual churches. We know that the Lord's church is independent and autonomous, and he deals with each one independently and separate. So he says to Ephesus, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast had patience for my name's sake, and labored, and hast not fainted. Very positive stuff. We never want to hear this from the Lord. Not that. This. Nevertheless. Very positive stuff, but then he says, But I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember Jesus said the love of many will grow cold? That, that has varying degrees of truth to it. In this case here, he tells them to remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Well, they loved the word of God. They, they knew the word of God. They identified the word of God. They defended the word of God, but something was wrong. Something was terribly wrong in this church to the point to where Jesus was reprimanding them. So he says, remember from where you are fallen and repent. Do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place. So I, I really just wanted to read that. He's calling them to repentance, but based on what? What, did they, what was their problem? They had some very good points about them. The, the, the first love can be identified in several ways, I think. One, it could be their love for him. It could be their love for lost souls. They were very, and that happens to churches sometimes, where churches get so strong in the word of God and appreciate studying the deep things of the word of God that they forget that all around them, all around us, is lost souls that need to be saved. And the doctrine of the word of God is not going to save them. The only thing that will save them is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how we need to represent him as a church. And this church apparently had lost whatever love they had to where they were not doing that. They probably had all kinds of excuses. Times are hard. You're being persecuted. But whatever the case was, Jesus is calling them to repentance. This on the thought of what Jesus said that the love of many in the end will grow cold. We, that word love, by the way, that Jesus uses there in Matthew 24, is the word agapeo. And it means a preference, something you choose. We can choose a lot of things. We can choose this world and its philosophy, its money, its promises. We can choose those things. God's people can choose those things over the truth of the word of God. Now, I've said this before, and the more I think about it, the more I understand it to be true, that no matter what, 
we're always in a position of sacrifice. We are either sacrificing the things of the world for the things of God and the eternal truths, or we're sacrificing those things, the word of God, the promises therein, for the things of this world. There is no stagnancy in serving God. There is no status quo when serving God. And I, I think sometimes God's people can get to a place where it's status quo. Let's just hold on. Let's just keep things as they are. Where the word of God tells us we need to constantly be moving forward and growing in him and witnessing to the world. That could possibly bring persecution. But one thing I wanted to point out in Luke's gospel was that he said this is an opportunity to testify. Whenever we're persecuted, it's an opportunity to testify of our faith in the Lord, even if it means our life. And many of our <coughs> forefathers have done just that. They've given up their lives for their love of Jesus Christ, and it was a powerful testimony. I'll just insert this for you to think about. Where would Saul of Tarsus be if it wasn't for the testimony of Stephen? Think about that. Stephen gave his life, never saw the results of his testimony, and yet after that event, when Stephen was dead with the Lord, Saul was converted. And everybody I know thinks that it's a result, of course, of the Holy Spirit, but ultimately of Stephen and his stand for the truth. It greatly affected Saul of Tarsus. In chapter 3, Revelation, verse 14, So that was the first church that Jesus writes to. I think this is the last church. Yeah. The Laodicean church. Now, those that do believe that uh, these churches represent different church ages, this age that we live in is called the Laodicean age of the church age, the Laodicean period. There's actually some, I mean, you can make the tie in with that. I don't really think that's the purpose, but uh, you, you can make points. And there's certainly a strong point to be made that this Laodicean church and its spirit, its attitude, certainly represents a lot of churches today. Keeping in mind that Jesus is addressing in Matthew chapter 24 his church at that time, but then by extension the churches throughout the ages, each individual church throughout the age. So in this letter here he says to the angel of the Laodicean church these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. Remember I said earlier that a lost person, somebody who does not know the Lord, cannot be cold or hot for the Lord. They're just neutral. No matter what they do, they, they can be on fire in preaching what they know about the Lord, but if they're lost, it doesn't mean a thing means nothing. So they can't be cold or hot. They can't, you can't fall away from something you don't have, and you can't increase in fervor something that doesn't exist. So this church is behaving very carnally. They're neutral. And that actually disgusts the Lord. A neutral person, a stagnant person, somebody who is complacent and satisfied with the status quo they're hard to deal with. They're hard to convince one way or another because, quite frankly, they don't care. They don't care. They, they've shown they don't care by their actions. And this is an I don't care church. So Jesus said, I would, I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth, vomit you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind. That to me is a very powerful verse. This church sees itself as beautiful, brilliant. They have all kinds of stuff. Let's, let's, let's move this forward 2,000 years in time and consider some of the beautiful, magnificent cathedrals that have the name Christ on them, or church on them, or whatever on them, 
And they look so good, they're so active, they're busy, they're religious, have all kinds of activities for people. They have singles programs, youth programs, all these different ministries going on, and yet it's all for nothing. It's all show. The Lord's churches are trying to imitate, in a lot of cases today, those type of churches with beautiful buildings, um, a lot of fun events, a lot of active ministries going on, and what's being sacrificed for that? Only the Lord can deal with a church in that event, but they say, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, yet they don't know that they're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Um, I'll, leave, I'll say this, though, <clears throat> in all fairness and truth, that the churches of the world that are not, that do not belong to the Lord, um, this really doesn't apply to them. They, they've come along via or by lies. What this is really dealing with is a church that knows the truth, has understood the truth, has stood for the truth, and yet sacrificed that for the goods of this world. So he says here um, in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and that, that gold is not necessarily the gold of this world, that you may be rich, not in the things of this world. Historically speaking, the Lord's churches have been the poor ones. The churches with the little buildings, that are just satisfactory to hold a meeting place for the people of God. So I wonder what sacrifice has been made over the years for these types of things. There's nothing wrong with taking care of what the Lord has and what we use for him. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not the point here. The point is where our love lies and what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish. So he says, try, buy from me, Gold tried in the fire that you may be rich in white raiment, spiritual things, and that thou may be clothed, spiritually clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, while this is written to a church, this can be applied to individuals as well. Every one of us, every one of us has been in a position at one point in our lives where we have been called upon the Lord to repent. Every one of us. If not our salvation, that's a, a definite certainty. Every one of us at one point was called by the Lord to be saved. But even after that point, perhaps many times, we have been called to repent. Turn from ourself and turn to the Lord. Put away the things that are taking our focus off of spiritual things and get our eyes focused on the Lord. That is the call that all of us individually face. Several more passages I want to consider here, just briefly, actually. We've covered these a number of times, but first of all, Ephesians. I told you I was going to come back to this letter, this church. One of the most powerful passages in my mind, in my opinion, of repentance is found in chapter 2 of this passage, this letter. So I'm going to read it for you. And I explain a little bit, but in verse 1 of chapter 2, Jesus says, and you, the Ephesus church, and really the individuals of the church, because the church is made up of those that have been made alive. We don't baptize people who are not saved. We want to be confident that they are saved, because quite frankly, to baptize somebody who is not saved does more damage than it does good. It provides false security where there is no security whatsoever. It does not matter if your name is on a church roll, if you are not saved. <laughs> anyway, verse 1 here says, And you hath he quickened, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past ye, the individuals of these, this church, every one of them walked according to the course of this world. That is true for us as well. Every one of us at some point has walked according to the course of this world. Perhaps some still are in one way or another according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That is a reference to Satan, who controls the spirit of the air, the, the, the spirit world of this world, not the churches. 
among whom also you all had your conversation, or we all, actually, let me rephrase that because Paul makes this personal for himself. Among whom also we all had our conversation, our conduct, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature children of wrath, even as others. Now here's where the Bible, the, the but in the Bible is good. <laughs> in a previous reading, uh, it wasn't good. Here it is good. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, and that is every one of us, every one of us was dead in sins. He hath made alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved. In the end, sin is going to abound. We see it happening now, that there, there is almost a no-holds-barred attitude when it comes to iniquity. Whatever you want to do, no matter how ugly or how sinful it is, you cannot call it wrong. If you do, you're a hater. You can't call sin, sin. You have to give it some other name. That's sad. It's all around us. It affects us. We are immersed in sin. There's no way that we can get away from it. We can't escape this. And with that being said, oftentimes we will, and I've said this before, and I'm guilty just as anybody else, we actually pay to have sin piped into our homes via the television. Is there anything on television that is godly or worth watching? Well, there's some. There's some wholesome things to watch for sure. But over 90% of it is trash, is filth. It's not godly at all and it's filling the minds recently disney sorry Janine. Um, <laughs> recently disney uh, came out and said one of their active goals one of their active goals in producing cartoons for children is to promote the lgbq and there's like eight more letters they've added to that now to promote it and make give these people or these cartoon characters a prominent place in society so that it, it, it really indoctrinates children to accept these things. That's frightening. That's frightening that there is no shame in that. Uh, two more passages, Titus. The book of Titus, Paul's letter to Titus. <clears throat> in chapter 3, verse 3 through 7. Uh, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And everything he says there is something that's possible for God's people. But after that, the kindness of the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So let's go back now to something I stated earlier, that this message is intended to be a positive one. There's going to be trials. There's going to be suffering by God's people. There is sinful conditions all around us. We have lost, collectively, God's people have lost souls to the world because they have chosen this world and its lust over the things of God. They're sacrificing the things of God. How can we escape all of that? With, with the abundance of sin, iniquity everywhere, how can we escape it? The same way we were saved, by the grace of God. We need to choose rather to, than immerse ourselves in iniquity and sin, to immerse ourselves in the grace of God that can deliver us and the deliverance we're looking for, that salvation we're looking for, is the deliverance of our lives from this world to be glorified with him. That's our hope. That, can, that won't happen to a lost person. A lost person will not be glorified together with him. It is only the saints that overcome. Last passage I want to look at in Romans chapter 5. As we prepare for a song of invitation, Romans chapter 5 and verse 20 says this. Paul writing this letter 
to the saints in Rome, a very ungodly, iniquity-filled place. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But, again, this is a positive but, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, and that has always been the case with God's people. In Egypt, God's people were surrounded by sinful activities. In fact, when God's judgment was beginning to come upon Egypt, they were protected, and then they were delivered. There's a great similarity between that exodus of Egypt and God's people exiting this world. God is going to provide the grace. He has already provided the blood. All we have to do is trust in Jesus Christ and be willing to commit ourselves to him. It's wonderful when somebody gets saved. I, I rejoice in that. But we want them, the word of God wants them, God wants them to commit themselves to him so that they can be an active participant in his ministry so that others can have the same thing through their testimony. It's a wonderful plan. I was saved that way by the testimony of others. You were saved that way by the testimony of others. How many people are not being saved because our testimony is not one for the Lord? Only God knows that. We're going to stand in this time and have a song of invitation. <clears throat> I don't know the hearts of those who may be listening to this. Only God does. If your life isn't right with Christ, if you've never trusted him as your savior, you have this opportunity. It only takes a moment of time to repent of your sin and turn and trust in him. A moment of time. There's nothing you need to work out. There's nothing you need to do. Just put your faith in him. And then be ready because he's going to call on you to follow after him. Brother Renee talked about that in the call of Peter and the rest of the apostles. Where do you stand in this message, in this call? What page, brother? 383. If there's a need here this morning, you need to be saved, you can come down to the altar here. You can put your faith in Christ. Stand where you are. I like the altar, though. I was saved at the altar. You can be saved wherever you're at. What page, brother? 383. 380. As we sing. Jesus is Thank you for your attention. I hope that each one received a blessing from the services today. Is there a word from anyone before we dismiss this morning? As a church, we do have business meeting. Um, I think we decided to do it right after, correct? And then afterwards, we'll um, dismiss for the day. Probably have some lunch and fellowship or whatever the case is. But it's been a good day in the Lord. Good to see each one here. Good to see those that uh, haven't been here in a while. Mary and Ricky, good to see you. Emmanuel, good to see you guys. Anything on your heart before we dismiss? Yes. Thank you.